My name is Jerry Gill. Today is May 18th, uh, 2010. I'm visiting with Brian Kent Sampson uh, at the Oklahoma State University campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This interview is for the Old State Storage Project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Uh, Kent, you're, you're very special to thousands of the students and former students here at Oklahoma State University in your, is it 41 year career? That's about right. Yeah. Uh, in residential and student life, you've, you've literally touched the lives of thousands of students. Uh, but before we talk about the experience, so Ken, I'd like to back up okay. and ask you a little bit about your life before OSU. Okay. Can you kind of share a little bit about your early life where you grew up, yeah. uh, your parents, yeah. et cetera? I was raised in good old Grady, Grady County down there, uh, raised on a farm 10 miles southwest of Chickasha. And, uh, actually went to a small rural school by the name of Pioneer for my first eight grades. And my uncle, as a matter of fact, was my math teacher in that little Pioneer school. And Pioneer had lost its high school, so then uh, went the additional 10 miles into town to Chickasha, where I went a night through the 12th grade. So graduated from Chickasha High in 65. And uh, actually, the interesting, one interesting thing about my background, Jerry, is raised in Chickasha, I was very well acquainted with um, OU and University of Oklahoma because we were so close in geographic proximity. I spent a lot of time there on the campus uh, in my high school years. And I wasn't very acquainted with Stillwater at that time at OSU. And I actually, at that time as I was finishing high school, I was trying to make some decisions on what to do next in terms of college. I knew I was going somewhere. And I got a small scholarship offer. Uh, I ran track in high school. Uh, pretty average track competitor, by the way, but I ran track, quarter mile and mile relay, things like that. So I got a small scholarship offer to go southwestern at Weatherford. So that's where I started in the fall of 65, did my four years there, I got my bachelor's degree at southwestern. So that's kind of, you know, from Chickasha to Weatherford, Oklahoma. Uh, and the only other thing I'd say about uh, upbringing, other than, other than what brought me here, was um, my parents, uh, uh, my dad was full Norwegian, uh, uh, Blanchard Sampson, B.G. Sampson, born in Illinois, and then his parents that had moved them to uh, Grady County in the early uh, 1900s because they felt that the environment that they were around in Illinois, about an hour south of Chicago, was kind of a little bit too liberal to raise a family in, uh, free-flowing booze and things like that, so my grandfather uh, moved uh, the family to and, and bought the land, a quarter section there in the Grady County. And um, let's see, the other thing I think I'd say about my parents and being raised, my mother was an educator, school teacher, administrator. Dad was a small time farmer and uh, also drove one of the public school buses for Chiggy Shea during his later years. And uh, both lived to be 92 mm -hmm. and uh, full lives. But, um, I guess that kind of takes me. I was one of five kiddos, one mm -hmm. daughter, uh, and four brothers, including two that are twins, mm -hmm. one set of twins. So anyway, I get to Southwestern, and um, and I, I should insert this about Southwestern probably. Like I said, I was a pretty average track guy. Uh, no no, no uh, fame and fortune there for sure, but did participate. I always said part of my reason for not being more successful in track was that I... Uh, my part-time job at night was working at Kinsville Aroma, where we specialized in pizza, charburgers, and steaks. And you know, they let you eat and drink there. And so I, I always had plenty to consume at Kinsville Aroma. So I'm sure I didn't keep the weight off as well as I might have because of the working at Kins. But or what really influenced um, my career <clears throat> was that in Southwestern, I got very involved in undergraduate activities. And I was selected as the outstanding senior in the graduating class, and I was student body president at Southwestern. Uh, and I helped, I was one of uh, four or five co founders of the Oklahoma Intercollegiate Legislature, which still exists today. Mm -hmm. After 40 years, our students, OSU students, sent a delegation up to the state capitol every fall and spring. We sent about 45 kids this year. So I helped form OIL, Oklahoma Intercollegiate Legislature. And my point is, <clears throat> it's those undergraduate years. Though I hadn't figured it out then, I knew that I had some ability in working with students and student issues, and I was willing to put the time in to provide leadership and service, but I didn't know there was such a thing as a career in that. Even though I knew my dean of students, Dr. Burris, who later became uh, president at Western Oklahoma State, 
and Clint Ponder was our dean of men. He was my track coach. So I knew that there were these guys who had a role with student life, kind of, mm -hmm. but I didn't really fully uh, know and appreciate that there was a career possible in that, or student affairs mm -hmm. as we know it. <clears throat> One other side note, maybe a humorous side, maybe I'll mention this. Um, I'll always remember my, Dean Ponder called me in the office. Uh, my, I guess it was the f early my senior year. Uh, it was a small Greek system, fraternity story system, and a bunch of us guys had felt like it didn't have a lot to offer. <clears throat> uh, so we formed our own club called the Collegiate Diners and Service Organization. And I just share this as a sense of uh, humor on this. Uh, we were very successful academically, leadership, service, intramurals, mm -hmm. so much so that some of the fraternities were being kind of threatened with membership because so many guys were interested in our group. In fact, my brother-in-law, who, who, who came from Boston, Massachusetts, to be a quarterback for the football team, was among the members. Anyway, make a longer story short, um, uh, Dean Ponder called myself and a couple of other officers in. He says, hey, boys, I've got right over here your, your resume and your academic record. And no, you've done well here, but I want you to realize you, you're damaging our small fraternity system here because so many people are coming to your group. So, therefore, I'm going to keep your <clears throat> records and materials here on my desk and challenge you guys to uh, either disband or charter nationally with a fraternity to bring to campus to be a part of the Greek system. That was my senior year. <laughs> so what finally happened was, and of course, then I graduate, move on, and come here to start graduate work. And so what finally happened, they ultimately did, and within that next year, affiliate with the National Phi Delta Theta. So they did become a fraternity, but not because we wanted to at the time, but because we really were required to. So I share that. Again, a part of that student life experience that I had in, in, uh, in student organizations. And then, Jerry, I head up here in the fall of 69 uh, after working in the summer, with Southwestern Company it's fought in the summer of 69 and come up here to start a graduate degree in psychology and uh, so and though I did take leave of absence for a semester with Zelma Patchen on semester C was a assistant dean of students on the ship and I can get to that later if you want to what an experience a full semester on the sea on the ocean with 700 students and you know, let me back and ask you a couple questions yeah. again kind of back to your life were well, there some uh, <clears throat> Yeah. Growing up, were there some values and principles that you learned from your family that influenced you in your success later in life? I mean, did working on a farm or other other things? Yeah. Like discipline. I think working on the farm where everybody had to pitch in and do something together. Mm -hmm. uh, I've said this many times to my kids: is that <clears throat> there's something about being raised in the country on the farm, particularly in, in these earlier years where you have to create your own fun, you have to be creative, it's not done for you, it's not an Xbox or a computer that you can get wrapped up in. You created your own experiences and fun and stories. So I, I think uh, the farm experience was great in terms of encouraging creativity, and of course my parents uh, being, being big on education, and my mother, my mother went back and got a bachelor's degree after she had five children. Wow. And then her master's degree at OU later, and ultimately we had, had, had in the Head Start program in Chigashay. So she taught first grade and then became an administrator. Well, so education was important to my parents as it was to my grandparents. And my grandfather, who was 96 when he died, actually lived in the house, the old farmhouse that we lived in that still stands today. And he had an influence because he had allowed uh, a little plot of land on our farm for a little small country school to be built called Banner School that's no longer there. And he was on the, uh, the school board mm -hmm. at Banner School mm -hmm. on our property way back in the early 1900s. So education came across as important to my parents and um, kind of a work ethic, you know, that uh, you all pitched in, uh, whether it was cotton or raising watermelons or things like that, you all kind of pitched in and contributed to the cause. Uh, the other thing that crosses my mind, Jerry, is that um, um, it, though my father could speak Norwegian and my grandfather, they were both full Norwegian, you know, all along, you, 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 the spoken language was always English. You needed to learn to be a part of the environment society that you were a part of. So, uh, did, you, did you learn any Norwegian? I, I did. Mm -hmm. and my main line is, how to do Nakashoma vet, 
which means don't you have any self-respect. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that line? <laughs> Somewhere along uh, the line, I taught that, I was taught that and I've never forgotten that. But, uh, Ken, being a farm grader, did you participate in 4-H or, or FFA? I or did. Mine was 4-H. And in, in the eighth grade at Pioneer School, my last year there, I was president of our local 4-H. Mm -hmm. I remember I entered a county fair and won 75 cents for something. I always remember the district supervisor said, gosh, you're a 4-H president and you, you only could win 75 cents worth of awards at the county fair. I said, yeah, I wasn't great at it. But, <laughs> but yeah, 4-H was influential. Uh, for me, I, I didn't continue it on in high school in Chickasaw, but I did them out there. What about some of your, your <clears throat> community and school activities in, in uh, Chickasaw? Uh, okay, I had a chance to be involved. Uh, I, I was class president my junior and senior year in Chickasaw. I um, did play sports. Uh, I went out for football my sophomore year in a, in a year where there were a lot of players, guys on the team, and uh, I did, so I played football all three years, and my senior year, because the guy ahead of me, I was a center, the guy ahead of me got canned for behavioral issues, I got to start my senior year the last eight of ten games or something, and I always remember the quote that Chief State Daily Express was, a hustling center found, because I wasn't a great athlete, but I played football those three years. <clears throat> I tried to play basketball and Coach Jerry Job, who later coached at Oklahoma Christian, a lot of people in the state knew Jerry. Uh, my sophomore year I went out, <clears throat> we had pretty good basketball, I went out and I'll always remember this line, Jerry, uh, Coach Job, after seeing me working out and trying to do my thing, uh, he pulled, and by the way, I carried the nickname in the Chickasha, the Pioneer. So if you talk to anybody at Chickasha these days who knows me, they say, oh, Pioneer Samson. So I carried that nickname from Pioneer School. So I always remember Coach Joe saying, pulling me to the side of the sophomore and he put up a little a metal folding chair. And he said, Pioneer, why don't you, during this scrimmage, this part of it, why don't you guard that metal chair? So that was the message I kind of got then that Coach Joe was feeling. Maybe I didn't have too much potential for basketball. He assigned me to guard the metal folding chair. So. I, I tried basketball, didn't work, played football three years, involved in student government things at the high school. And ran track, obviously. And ran track, that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. I, I did try it, and one thing, Jerry, in the annals of Chickasaw High, I don't know if you'll find it, went out for baseball my sophomore year, this is part of why I chose track, and I, we were playing against Anadarko, there was an all-state pitcher throwing against us, and I'll never forget getting up to bat, and I. I had never realized what a good curveball was till this guy threw it. And I was trying to protect myself and get out of the way. And of course it curves in a strike. And as I was doing that, the bat hits the ball and it trickles up the infield. I get a base hit. I knew I couldn't hit from then on. So I have the only lifetime batting average of chick high of a thousand because I was one for one. That scared me to death and I moved to track. <laughs> A couple of other questions. <coughs> Tell me, after your four years at, there at, at Southwestern at Weatherford, mm -hmm. you sold books with Southwestern Company for one I, I, summer. That summer. Yeah. Door to door, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Did you work with Spencer Hayes? I did. Mm -hmm. I can, did. Can you share it just real briefly some of your experiences at Southwestern? You know and what? what, what I went, where you benefit from <clears throat> Trained in Nashville, worked in Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, Northwest Ohio in the Toledo Bowling Green area, lived in a little town named. Ottawa, Ohio, and that summer I even had a chance to do some volunteer work for a little local Methodist church with some kids and then the sales, and that was the summer I got to see Neil Armstrong walk on the moon while I was doing that, working in Ohio that summer. And we trained with Southwestern in Nashville and then got that assignment myself and a couple other guys. And uh, it, it was about self-discipline. It was about a work ethic. It was about learning to promote or sell a product. And what I particularly <clears throat> remember, even today, and I've reminded my kids this as they grow up, I, of their saying and their logo, their motto, I can, I will, I'm going to, which is a great reminder about motivation and how much of what we do is controlled and influenced by what we think we can do rather than what somebody told us we can do or can't do. So I had a great summer there and uh, and then came here and started grad school. But uh, 
uh, got a lot of training, got a lot of support, and uh, it, it, it's a great experience for a young guy to have to be a little more self-sufficient and uh, to believe in something and to promote something. What, uh, what influenced you? So 1969, after that summer at Southwestern, you graduated and you, you came to Oklahoma State University. Mm -hmm. what, was that, is that correct? Yes. What, uh, what influenced you to come to OSU? Did you didn't you stay at, at, you know, at OSU, were you also looking at maybe a career here, or what, what was your decision? You know, grad school was why I came, <clears throat> and uh, I had applied for and looked. I was thinking of a, I, my thought then, because my undergraduate majors, I had a double major in psych and so, psychology and sociology in Southwestern, so I was thinking of grad school in psych, I was thinking of clinical psych, and about then OSU got their uh, American Psychological Association accreditation. Mm -hmm. I had also applied to the University of Colorado. I, I was also looking at one school in Europe. Uh, I, I had four or five other serious things in the mill. But being gone all summer, I get back in August, and I had to make a decision. And really, like I mentioned earlier, I really had, had a lot of exposure to OU, but not much to Stillwater, and specifically OSU, not a lot. But I liked the material I got from them, and I think I was still trying to decide uh, uh, between o OSU and other schools, I decided I like what they've sent me, what they've suggested, so I'm going to go to Stillwater, go to OSU and do my master's. And of course, therefore, I was still within two hours of Chickasha and people I knew in my family. So I came here to study psychology. So it was the academic focus that brought me here at that time. It was not about student affairs or even a career in that yet. You hadn't decided yet about a career in student affairs, huh? Really hadn't then. Really was just, uh, <clears throat> I was thinking the PhD in, in clinical psych mm. and dealing with people with behavioral issues, serious behavioral issues. That's kind of what brought me here. So Ken, you were then, you were sort of a working student. Other words, did, you accept a, did you accept a position and was working with the university and then working yeah. concurrently on your that's graduate right. studies, is that right? That's what, mm -hmm. that's the clincher for me career-wise. <clears throat> a guy named uh, Al, uh, as I was getting my enrollment status taken care of in August of 69, I ran into uh, at the, single, uh, the old single student housing office on the second floor of the union. I was student union, I was looking into housing options. And somehow that day I was introduced to Mel Wright, who was a for all American basketball player here, who was then assistant director of housing, who was looking for grant assistance. <clears throat> he introduced me to Al Lewis, who was the head resident then of what was then 12 stories. The Wilhelm Complex then wasn't named Wilhelm Complex, it was Wilhelm 12 story. Great story there too, by the way, about students, but I'll come back later. Wilhelm 12 story. And they needed an assistant head resident in 12 story, which was a men's residence hall, 12 story. Wilhelm South was 14 stories, and it was women then. So Mel, as I was just checking into housing, we got acquainted, and he said, well, do you have a job or assistantship? I said, no. He said, would you be interested? I said, well, maybe. Because I had been a resident assistant at Southwest at RA on a floor in Neff Hall. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> uh, he introduced me to Al Lewis. Mm -hmm. I met also Lynn Jackson, somebody that you knew, uh, who was director of single student housing then, and they offered me that job. So I start as assistant head resident in 12-story, Wilhelm 12-story, in fall of 69. And that's, while I was working on my academic master's degree, <clears throat> and the experience I got of being assistant head resident and then head resident the following year in Murray Hall for men, and then the following year, I was complex director back at Wilhelm, managed the entire complex, and it was that period of time where I decided, as I looked at my academics and my experience, I said, gosh, this is, this is, people have careers in this, people do this. And Jerry, at the same time, I realized where clinical psych was taking me with psychopathology and personality theory and so forth was into a little bit more of a narrow area of pe dealing with people on the ends of the behavioral continuum, mm -hmm. where sometimes you don't see a lot of progress. And I knew myself well enough to know I'm probably more effective with people in that middle of the continuum, maybe like you and me, who have regular ups and downs like mm -hmm. students do, rather than more extreme. So a combination of seeing that clinical psych was taking me more to those extremes and the experiential thing I was getting in single student housing later, <clears throat> later residential life, helped me say, 
this might be a career because I, I was doing this in undergrad at Southwestern and I liked that and uh, and now I'm finding out there's people who do this for a living kind of thing. Well, uh, Ken, at what time did it change from you as a graduate assistant position when you were first working in Murray Hall? Did you work then full time you employed by the university when you went to take over the complex? Uh, Good point. I was assistant head resident half time, 69 70 in Wilhelm. Mm -hmm. Summer of 70, then I was asked to be a head resident or full time hall director head resident in Murray Hall for men. So 70 71. Okay. Actually, I finished 70 71 and I had just been promoted to Wilhelm Complex Director the spring of 71, which I served that summer when and Pat Murphy, by the way, had stepped aside as residence hall program coordinator. Mm -hmm. He had moved to counseling here. He is followed by a one-year person named Walter Price, who still lives here in town, a retired colonel, I believe. He had worked one year as residence hall program coordinator, and I think the fit wasn't great for him and students. So he stepped aside. So the summer of 71, they said, how about leaving? I'd just taken the Wilhelm job as complex director. Over the, so I didn't even complete four or five months. They said, we'd like for you to, to offer you the job as program coordinator for single student housing, which means you'd work with student life, student organization, student government. So I said yes. <clears throat> and the, in August of 71, Jerry, I moved into that role, which I held for six years. And interestingly enough, August of 71 is when we hosted Nakura, the National Residence Hall Student Leader Conference here. So I moved in in August 71 as the advisor of that group, and now all of a sudden had a national advisor role because our students had won the bid and were hosting all these schools from around the country here in August of 71. So uh, half time for a year, and then full time for like a year and a half, I guess you'd say, before I then went into the office or administrative side of single student housing. <clears throat> Ken, to kind of continue where I, I know you, if, if I looked your resume correctly, uh, you worked in residential life through, I think, 97 through 1997 before you moved into your current position. Is that right? That's could, right. Could you kind of summarize some of the, and I know it's pretty lengthy, but I'm saying summarize, briefly summarize, but just some of the major responsibilities during that 20-some-odd oh, years. Yeah, ago. my duties were these over those years. Program coordinator, the you know, so assistant head resident, head resident complex director, then in the administrative office area, program coordinator for six years, seventy one through seventy seven, working with our student leaders in RHA. And of course, RHA was a, always it, it has been and still is a influential big student organization since they represent five six thousand students. Then they had as many as eight thousand students they represented. Uh, so in seventy seven. <clears throat> Uh, and by this, by the way, during this time, I'm on the third floor of the student union, room 354, and RHA's right next door to me. Then they add the, I had the title of assistant director of single student housing for student life. I still had the RHA side, but then I was being asked to do more on the student life side in the residence halls collectively. But we had 27 halls then, I think. So as assistant director, uh, took that role in 77, and later became associate director uh, during that period of time. Uh, and all of that was seven, from 77 really through 96, 97, those 20 years, uh, I was, the student life part was what I was responsible, of, responsible in housing, except in 1985 an important change took place when single housing, married housing and maintenance and food service all merged together. So from 85 to 97, in addition to the student life side, then I took over half of the campus responsibility for dining and also for maintenance and housekeeping. So, uh, so I was associate director for that area, but from, for those, what, nearly 12 years, 85 to 97, I took on the dining component as well as the manager or supervisor for, for dining and also housekeeping and, and maintenance. So if you would, that, though it gave me more responsibility, and broadened my scope, and I worked with some great people in maintenance and housekeeping and, and dining, some real committed people. And this has a little bit to do with me making the change in 97. I think it also took me a little bit away from what I thought I was best at, had the most experience at. So. Uh, so, so those 20 years, 
uh, so I guess 77 to 85 would have been primary student life, then 85 to 97, still student life, but now I had broadened mm -hmm. that area a little bit more because of this Department of Residential Life coming together and Bob Huss being brought in, all those areas coming together. Uh, so that had, and that had some influence <clears throat> on me because I could have certainly stayed there. And of course, I had a lot of people ask me about housing director jobs elsewhere. Uh, but I'll always remember when Ron Beer and Tom Keyes created this new position, this new department. Uh, one of the people I sought out then and asked for advice, I was trying to decide, is this the time, do I make a shift from Res Life after all these years, 20 some years? And I sought out former President Cobb among others, and asked him his opinion, his advice. Ken, what, t two things, but who were some of, you mentioned some of the names, but who were some of the people and personalities in residential life, particularly in those early years uh, yeah. that, that you worked with, and, you, and, and, and do, you have some, do you have some favorite stories about some of them? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I, somewhere in there I need to lead off with Tom Zach Cooper, and I got his email address this year. One of our foundation officers found him on the West Coast. Zach was president of our RHA, but also president of Nakura in 71 when I came in, and there's really interesting historical fact and about Nakura is. I'm sorry, Nakura is the National Association of College and University Residence Halls, Thank the you. National Student Leader Organization. That group that we hosted here during August of 71. Zach was president, and Zach led the effort to get it to, get it to become incorporated. So Nakura, even today, in the year 2010, its records and founding official documents are filed in Oklahoma City with the Secretary of State because Nakura Incorporated in Stillwater, Oklahoma in 1971 under the leadership of, of Tom Zach Cooper. So I've got to mention Tom as one of those early pioneers and leaders and very, uh, very active, very solid nationally as well as here, so I need to mention Tom. And I think it's student leaders and, and staff leaders as well. Staff the, yeah, leaders. Shayla Airy was associate director of single student housing then, who went on to become a, uh, a, a national leader in the state of uh, Maryland, one of three commissioners for higher education in Maryland. Shayla was very influential, and by the way, during the summer she would go to Las Vegas and deal cards. She was single, never married. Um, Zelma Patchen was associate dean of students, dean of women, a uh, very influential lady on me and uh, is responsible for she and I getting to take leave of absence and going on semester to see with her. Mel Wright in housing then and Al Lewis had an influence on me then. Later on, a colleague of mine who still today is in the business, Floyd Holting, was in school with me at the same time, did his doctorate here, went to Western Illinois went to Illinois State, took an early retirement at Illinois State, and has now done 12 years as Director of University Housing and Res Life at the University of Texas at Austin. Mm -hmm. Floyd is 67 now, I think, and still working down there, and came to our daughter's wedding. We'll come to this daughter's wedding. So Floyd and I are longtime pals, if you would, in the profession. Uh, I'll always remember Floyd and former Vice President Norman Moore, the picture in the Redskin yearbook of, of them being hung in effigy on the porch of Murray Hall, because they had announced that we were going to have to close Murray Hall that year <laughs> due to declining occupancy. <clears throat> um, Lynn Jackson was a great guy. Lynn had been in the business world and then got the student personnel masters. So Lynn was the strong physical person, but and you know, you remember him. He was a quiet guy, wasn't, wasn't noisy, didn't want a lot of attention, but very competent and very ethical. So Lynn was director of single student housing then and was a good leader for those times because uh, it was a time of a lot of change and challenge and it's a time of a lot of growth. We just opened up all these new high-rise residence halls, Wilhelm, Wilhelm Complex as it became, Kerr and Drummond and Scott Parker Wentz, our first vertical uh, efforts in residential life. So Lynn was a good guy for the time with his business head and because of his uh, his stability and maturity, you know, uh, he was, and his wife Frances still lives today in Nevada. I still stay in touch with her. Well, picking up on your comments, uh, Ken, about changes in the high rise, uh, in your opinion, what have been some of the major changes in, in residential life uh, during your career? I mean, and of course, I one comes to mind is the physical facilities like yeah. we were talking about, but, uh, but you might think about philosophy of staffing, student expectations, student experiences, different changes okay. that you recall. One thing I want to mention, Jerry, for this record is, um, and uh, 
Louis Sanderson, former comptroller, financial officer, wonderful guy that I served on the University Health Care Committee years after he retired. What a bright guy, financial officer. Louis recounted this story to me even about the history of me before I came about us going vertically called building high rises. He said, I'll never forget this, he said, well, Kent, you know, what drove us to build the high rises were two things. One is there was not adequate at all or enough housing in the city of Stillwater to house this population that we were having. And number two is the post-war baby boom. All of these military veterans' children were, and veterans themselves were coming to college. So what had happened, uh, the, the post-war baby boom, as it's referred to, had all these children of these veterans coming to campus and there was no housing. So if we were going to grow, the university was going to have to grow it, as Sanderson recounted that. So what happens in a hurry, in five to eight years, uh, Wilhelm Complex with 14 and 12 stories housed uh, 1,500 students. Kerr Drummond housed 1,400 students, double rooms. Wentz Hall, a 10-story building, housed 567 students. And then Scott and Parker, each about 230 students. So all of a sudden, we went vertical. And, and of course, that was the most economical, efficient way to get there. So as Sanderson reminded me, if you we we're going to grow as a university and, and accommodate with housing because the city wasn't there, we had to go vertical. So I, I insert that here because that, so people they say, why do they have high rises? Or they're old or they're not attractive. Again, you got to reflect on the time. Mm -hmm. And that had a lot to do with OSU's capability of growing when higher education was starting to boom also. In the 60s, mid to late 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I would mention, I'd mention that in this context, Jerry. I would say, don't forget the 70s were a turbulent, difficult time. The Vietnam War, among other things, going on and um, it was a time there are words in our profession Latin words in loco parentis meaning in in the role or in place of the parents there's no question higher education generally for the most part including OSU and our Board of Regents coming into that time uh, were practicing in loco parentis and that was the norm of the day in place of the parents and with some of the changes in society then, more freedoms, came a gradual erosion or change from in loco parentis. And also uh, the age of accountability of students, which was then 18, later became 21, for example. But So students were being, being asked to be more treated like adults with the same rights and privileges, freedoms, confidentiality. So over time, that came in the 70s and early 80s. So my point is, <clears throat> some of the turmoil in the country in the Vietnam War is a convenient stopping point for, for this discussion, but it's not all about feelings around that war. It was about societal changes, too, and the notion of in loco parentis and higher education changing. So my point is, part of that change came about because students said, uh, treat us like adults. We want to be treated not like don't, don't go to our parents for our grades. Talk to us about our grades, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything from uh, uh, I, I still remember the the gatherings of more than a thousand or so thousands of students going moving about the campus at night with their chant, "No more hours, no more hours." And their point was they were challenging the administration and board of regents to say, "You should." not require women to have hours in residence halls, whatever those hours were, maybe it's 11 p.m. on weeknights or something. You should no more hours, no more hours chant. Ultimately, this gets to the Board of Regents, and as those who are around here know, the irony and humor of this, of course, is what happened. They imposed hours on men. <laughs> so all of a sudden, men who had no hours had hours, as did women. But that was the notion of the movement then, some of the movements. Uh, I still remember John O'Connor, who's a lawyer down in in Tulsa, was student body vice president, and he, even today we've laughed about this now, he's a lawyer in Tulsa. Uh, he and some guys, along with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's now in the U.S. Supreme Court, she was a lawyer in this case, who decided to challenge this age of accountability uh, in terms of the alcohol law in this state. And John and some student leaders teamed up with others. One young man who was a sick, uh, who was a, a Lamba Kai, who's, who's now deceased, uh, challenged this and Ginsburg was a lawyer who picked it up and took that forward. So challenging the drinking age, the hours, and you know, uh, 
some societal unrest. I, I remember the African American boycott for a period of time. I always remember President Com in a very difficult dilemma, and it all happened because some yo-yo on University Avenue uh, made the poor mistake of shooting with a BB gun an African American female walking along University Avenue. And that was just a catalyst to blow some things up. So now all of a sudden the African-American students are boycotting the campus and have gone to Lake Carl Blackwell where groups of student affairs administrators go out and try to visit and counselors, Howard Ship and other people at that time talking with them, former President Com going out there. So it was a mood and a time of some uh, angst. And it was a lot more than a Vietnam War, though it certainly had its presence and some protests. It was about some societal changes Can going you, on. How did that? How did that impact uh, just, you know staffing decisions or program decisions in, in residential life? How, how did how did how did that shape change? Um, those movements did a few things. It caused, first of all, it I think it forced the university and Student Affairs Administration housing to kind of relook priorities a little bit and at least dialogue them, though there was some opposition to that, of course, administration, but to at least take a look. It also required us to take a look in then a way that's, in a way, has a consistent theme with today with campus security. You still were people who are responsible for state property in the environment. So all of a sudden you had to kind of take a look at staff duty, coverage, policies. I, I remember uh, during part of the time of unrest, the fire being set in the Stout Hall lobby. You know, during this time of unrest, the curtains were put on fire, and, you know, of course people caught it and took care of it, but, you know, somebody committed arson there. So it was a time where you kind of took a look at your security and you never worried about it quite that much, but all of a sudden there were some people in extreme positions who were going to do it one way or the other. And some of those the other caused us to take a look at some situations. I remember the OSU police had their little Quonset hut out behind the current business building and somebody dropping a homemade bomb in front of the OSU police office one night that was a dud and didn't go off. But So there were some radical extremes like there were in the country where people wanted it now, wanted it their way. So it caused us to look at security even then, in the early 70s, as we've had to look at security in a different light, you know, in the, in the, in the 2000s. Well, Ken, how did changing from the high-rise, you know, with the traditional one, two, three-story halls, the high-rise halls, 12, 14 stories high, then, then in the, was it in the 80s, mm -hmm. this movement started in the 90s, especially mm -hmm. moving to uh, apartment-style uh, uh, yeah. complexes and units. Yeah. Uh, Apartment suites, etc. How did that? How did that change uh, residential life? How did, how did it change the student experience? That's a great question. And even these days, Jerry, once a month, President Hargis asks me to facilitate lunch meetings with he and students. And even today, he has heard students who live in both environments make comments pro and con. And the point is this: when we what had happened, of course, society had involved, evolved enough that there were no longer siblings sharing bedrooms. Sh siblings were coming to campus with their own bedroom, sometimes their own bathroom. An expectation began to be there. Well, I need more privacy or my own space even more. Bedroom. Can you explain to me in the high in the high rise hall? What was the situation there? Yeah, the high room, the high rise halls were double loaded quarters, normally 32 rooms per floor, <clears throat> 30 to 30, so 64 students per floor. Two, comp, two large common area bathrooms and a floor lounge and of course the elevators. So there was a sense of, if you will, required community whether or not you wanted it because you met each other in the elevator, in floor lounge meetings and programs and in the bathrooms. So that's what we came from with the high rises to the private suites and apartments that society had begun to get used to. And I'll never forget, go ahead. You know, I was going to interrupt to just, and, and what was part of that thing that you speak the fact that you also had floor, you know, you had floor officers uh -huh. you know, on like the 12th floor of Kerr, That's 14th right. floor of Durham, you had floor officers, uh, intramural teams, intramural teams. That's so right. there's this real sense of community built not only within the complex but by, by floors. Right. It? That's yeah. exactly right. I remember Kerr 12 had a guy named Jay Jones on it and a guy named Steve Crowder who's now the Vice President for Fiscal Affairs at UCO 
in Edmond as the two examples. And they had decided we're going to make Kurt 12 a leadership floor because these guys were movers and shakers. So they had recruited campus leaders to be on Kurt 12. And that's right. Floors took on identity. And we, we somewhere in that process started also what we call special interest housing. The most successful, longest running have been engineering floors in Kerr and Drummond. Mm -hmm. I think maybe half the floors in Kerr maybe now are engineering. Started maybe 30 years ago now. So, yeah, they took on floor identity in everything from intramurals to student government and sometimes even academic mm -hmm. on those areas. And, and then we get into the late 80s, early 90s and start these apartment suites and, uh, and of course incur lots of financial obligation and debt. One of the things that that, of course, did that drove up the price of housing. So now today in 2010, the most economical places that occur in Drummond and back then uh, they were the most expensive, you know, for sure. Uh, so, and what I've heard this year in my presidential luncheons with students, these are students who live in those areas. The students who live in those areas in current Drummond, the community areas, like it. And, and talk about community. And Burns hears that. And they, just like those who live in the suites and apartments, they sure like their privacy, but they don't know as many people. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. He's paid attention to that. He has heard that, how how it's changed and realizes it's maybe not all for the best in the sense of community and knowledge and who's around you and what their priorities are or their influences on you. Or, for example, if you have an alcohol drug issue or tendency, it's sure much easier to get by with that in a private facility, a private living area, than it was in a floor of 60 guys or gals. So it has changed the community since then. Uh, it's a little different when you have, a, I'm not sure, it used to be called RA, you know, mm -hmm. residential assistant. Resident assistant. Resident assistant on the floor also caught some potential behavioral That's problems. Right. I mean, to, to the benefit of students. I mean, That's sense. right. And you don't have that, I mean, again, they're living right there sharing the same space. It's a little bit different in an apartment complex. It, it is. And I think we have to need, not forget, particularly in our world of student affairs, student development, that I'm, it's been my career, is we're dealing with primarily a traditional age college population, 18, 19, and then, and of course, the older students are increasing in numbers and coming back. But their on campus population is primarily traditional, and they're going through developmental issues and challenges and changes for some, for some first time experiences. I don't think I can tell you many times that I ever questioned Jim Halligan as president. Boy, do I respect and care for Jim. I really value him. He honored me as outstanding administrator years ago. And boy, I really value Jim. He's a great guy. He was a great president. The one time I differed with him was, uh, and for what it's worth, I mean, he was the president, not me. But in this whole area of student development community, though he felt it was time to do away with those and get rid of those. And granted, we had to make upgrades and improvements. We did. And you could do that in those buildings. I really felt like um, we were sacrificing community in the sense of that, the presence and the value of that, most importantly, to students and student development in going too strongly as suites and apartments. That's the one difference I had. Yet I also realized the society we were around, what we were facing, the competition, I really realized it was a tough call, but that, that I felt like we sacrificed residential community to a degree with suites and apartments. Kent, maybe leads to, to another question. <coughs> you touched on some of them. Uh, the benefits of living in a residence hall. I mean, what would you say to students or to parents who say, yeah. you know, why should a student live in a residence hall? Okay, well that's an easy one. Probably got this down pat. Yeah, right? that's an easy one for me. Uh, it is. Uh, and of course, the important thing is that this is this research is more than what Kent thinks is uh, what we know is that students live on campus, make higher grades than those who live off campus, proven research nationwide as well as here. And secondly, they're more apt to graduate in four years if they live on campus. And then thirdly is it, obviously they have the opportunity to get better connected and get involved because we know that making connections, getting students to be be, to return to sophomore land has a lot to do, even in the academic room, academic realm, with did they get connected? Mm -hmm. Did they work things out with the roommate? Did they join a club or organization? So we found for sure holding power uh, clearly is really critical. Uh, we, we sometimes refer to it in Res Life as first day, first week, first month. How we treat them and how they feel first day, first week, first month has a lot to do, do they make it to sophomore land? Do they feel a part of the environment? 
Because a lot of kids, even with 22,000 students, come in from an environment, whether they're large school or small school, and increasingly they're coming from out of state. Um, if they don't get connected early, and connection is about campus community. Yeah, the, the community issue you talked about earlier, we were talking about it, the halls for, you know, versus the, the complexes, that same issue that you were talking about, the community, mm -hmm. getting, getting part of a floor, getting part of a community. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons Matt Brown, who's now director of Res Life, has bought into so strongly these uh, learning communities with human environmental sciences, college of business, engineering even further, recognizing one of the things that we can do in the suites and apartments to help enhance that is tie together students with similar academic interests. So that's how we're these days trying to do something to offset that tendency for some to isolate. Ken, what, uh, how, how has OSU Residence Hall program been viewed nationally over the years? That's a great question. Uh, it, OSU's Residence Hall program, uh, a few things I'll say about it. It's one. It's the only school in the country that's won the National School of the, of the Year award four times. San Diego State's won it three. So we've hosted the National Nakura Conference three times. Uh, and here's an interesting sidelight. A guy named Bob Tattershall, who's now Assistant Director of Housing at Washington State in Pullman, been there for maybe 20 years now. Bob was a student, was a four-point philosophy major here, lived in Cordell Hall, and ultimately became my grad assistant when he worked on his master's degree. It was Bob Tattershall who, we were a member of Makura, which is the Midwest affiliate of College University Residence Halls, the regional of Nakura, the national. Mm -hmm. And it went all the way from Texas to Montana. And Bob said, that is too large a chunk of the country. We need to break that up. So it was Bob Tattershall who led a co cause with a guy named Kevin White, who's now in Tennessee, and Steve Crowder in, uh, in, uh, at, at, works at, in, at UCO in Edmond, led a cause and ultimately brought about the creation of Swakura, the Southwest affiliate of College University Residence Halls. So uh, Bob led the charge to say, Let's, we need to create a new region. Makura is too large and encompassing. Texans can't travel to Montana always and, and pay those expenses. So that was created. So Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana became Swakura, mm -hmm. led by OSU's own Bob Tattershall. So again, a leader on the national front. One other thing I'd say about awards and recognition, they have a national clearinghouse of information, Nakura does called the National Information Center, NIC. And we it's a three-year term. We've had this, that National Information Center on this campus at least four times that I'm aware of. I haven't had it here in, I think, the last decade. but So 12 years, we've had hosted the National Information Center of Nakira here. So a lot of presence and involvement. This summer, I noticed our students are going to, uh, I believe the National Convention in June this year is at San Diego State. And we have student leaders again going to Nakira from OSU. To have a lot of them in the regional and national level from Oklahoma State that are elected to that's student right. leadership positions. Yeah, that's right. Well, what, what about uh, staff? I mean, like yourself and, and others, Oklahoma State through the years that have been participated in regional and national. I mean, and, I, and I want to get to that a little bit later in our conversation with you personally, but just generally, okay. has, have, has there been a lot of involvement from our staff? There has, uh, yes. <coughs> uh, I remember Lynn Jackson, when I first got acquainted with him. He was the state director for the Southwest Housing Officers Group. Um, I, I later became, in I think it was 81, 82 at Austin, Texas. I was president of the, of the SWACUO, the Southwest Housing Officers Group, and I was state director prior to that. Uh, yes, OSU has had, a, we've hosted the regional uh, Housing Officers Conference two or three times. Uh, and then, uh, in ACUHO, which is Association of College and University Housing Officers International, uh, from 83 to 85, I served on their National Executive Board as a Southern District Representative of the United States. So uh, some of us have even served on the National Housing Board. Bob Huss later served in that same role. Bob Huss, who was Director of Res Life, uh, served for the, as a Southern District Representative on ACUHO. So, uh, yeah, within the housing associations, as well as a broader student affairs associations, uh, our st staff have a history of being pretty involved. How has the organizational management structure of residential life, you know, formerly single student housing and residential life, 
How's it changed during your tenure? Okay. Uh, when I came here, and get, and just think about this, students and moms and dads see kind of one quote payment for room and board, it's, it's, as it's been called. They come here to live and they want to be fed. But along the way, they want hot water and they want to be safe and they want to have uh, a clean environment. So when I came here, there were those three departments, single student housing, food service, and, and university apartments and maintenance. It's a model that had worked, I think, for years. Abe Hester was the vice president then of Auxiliary Services, and he had a background in this area. Who was, who was by the way, was, was Abe, who was vice president when you came Abe here? Hester was, was the vice president, president then. He was for one or two years and then succeeded by Norman Moore. Mm -hmm. And then Ron Beard came as VP. Um, so, uh, changes organizationally was, the, the, the analogy, I guess I want to draw, mom and dad write the check for room and board, but there are three different departments, and sometimes you're competing for that same dollar. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, as a matter of fact, I wrote the paper in consultation with several other of our staff members when um, Lynn retired in 1985, 84, fall of 84, suggesting that those would be merged together because there was one one director had retired, Dick Williams from Married Housing Maintenance. Lynn now had retired and it only left Joe Blair, director of dining. So I, I, I wrote the position paper in consultation with several other folks about maybe it's time with a new model to look at merging those together. And sure enough, um, that vice president then, Ron Beer, who had been here five years then, accepted that and did that. And then Bob Huss from the University of Georgia was hired in to be the director for this new system that integrated all those services together, that one room and board dollar, if you would. So that's the hugest, most major change I've seen, Jerry, was the merging of, of those three components to become what's now known as residential life. That was the, the greatest, most significant change in my career was they all became one, if you would. Now, what's interesting, as they say, the pendulum swings one way and then the other. Now what's interesting is in the last two years that has changed a little bit in that uh, uh, residential life, of course, still exists, but dining was broken back out of that and a new director of dining was hired two years ago, Terry Baker. So now dining and housing are two, under two separate departments now. And then physical plant now supplies the housekeeping and maintenance. So it was actually broken out of res life too and moved to the physical plant. You've mentioned several names, Kim, but just briefly, are there some directors of residential life, other leaders in res life that stand out in your mind? Uh, you know, during my time and tenure here, the directors of housing res life were, of course, Lynn Jackson and then Bob Huss, and followed now by Matt Brown, who is an OSU graduate, by the way, he's come back from Northern Kentucky to head us. But beyond the, those director positions, and you, you want me to stay in res life for the time being? Res, res life right now, yeah. or we'll move up to the vice president they reported to as well. Yeah. Um, I tell you what, Ron Beer worked here as vice president from 1980 to 2000. I can't believe he's been out 10 years now. Ron was, uh, Ron brought a, he came here from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And Ron, interestingly enough, in fact, did programs on this later, Ron Beer and his colleague David Ambler, who was VP at Kansas University, were early early year professionals in Kent State with the Kent State shootings in the seventies. So they had been at a very high visible campus due to the campus tragedies, the National Guard shooting on that campus in the seventies or, or in the sixties. And so Beer comes here after working university, a Michigan State graduate, after working at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, with a good background of experience. And so he's a guy I would highlight as uh, really student oriented, really a guy willing to work with change over time. And, and as he told me many times before, he said his approach to the student body president each year was this. He said he would call that person in introduced himself, said, boy, congratulations on being elected. I'm really looking forward to working with you. And it would always make him this challenge. He'd say, he would say to them, 
in your role, you're going to be exposed to some situations, information, circumstances that are many times going to be privileged or confidential. And But I'm going to want to share with you all of those I can as a campus-wide student body president. Uh, and I hope you'll do the same with me. But if you ever breach that trust, then that will kind of terminate our relationship and our discussion because I, I, I want to entrust things to you. I want to have you involved with an input in decision making at the appropriate time. But for that to happen, we have to have a mutual trust and rapport. And I just use that example of Ron always challenging student body presence because he really wanted them to be involved and knowledgeable. He respected their opinion, but he also realized to do that, he would have to bring some things to the table sometime that weren't fully baked or couldn't be brought out yet, perhaps. So I really respected Ron's 20-year influence here in student affairs. And certainly Selma Patchen as she retired in the mid seventies, you know. And She's a legend too, wasn't you, Selma? She was. I'm so thrilled this year that the fraternity and sorority system that was all in, also in my area now um, decided to honor two people as they created their first, as they created a Greek fraternity and sorority hall of fame. Mm -hmm. Chuck Watson, who's living, mm -hmm. and uh, Sigma Chi, and uh, I'm sorry, they honored four people, four people: Chuck Watson and Joanne Roderick. Uh, who were inducted the Greek, New Greek and two posthumously, Daryl Troxell and Zelma Patchen. And they now have a Greek Life Hall of Fame that was started this year. And so wonderful for Zelma Patchen to be honored. She really deserved that. Super. And, and Jerry, I guess I, there's certainly a lot of people I've worked with in housing student affairs over the years that I've valued. And Amjada Yubi was a coordinator for me and now is director of uh, career services at Tulane University. And, I'm John was a young man who came, born in Jerusalem, born and raised in Jerusalem, and but Palestinian, and came as an international student, and ultimately got his doctorate and head of career services here, and uh, who was a great staff member, a student leader, and and always looked at things differently, which is why he could kind of challenge us to see, see how things could be improved. So, you know, I'm John's a hard one not to mention for sure. Joe Blair was using personality when he Joe did. was, and yeah. Joe Blair headed food service, and uh, his later years, he was president of NACUS, the National Association of College University Food Service Directors. I mean, big time job, and well known and respected, and uh, was known for doing great in dining with few dollars. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, should have had respect for Joe. Uh, Ken, in, in 1997, uh, you accepted the position of Director of Campus Life and an Associate Director of the Student Union and are currently still serving the same position with maybe some mm -hmm. minor responsibility changes. But can you talk about your job responsibilities uh, in the student organization that you, you work with today? Yes, and do you want me to start with kind of how the position was created? Sure. Tell, yeah, tell about where it's like today? Or? Just start, maybe start with what beginning, was created in the yeah. beginning and kind of bring it up today. Um, in the summer, in the spring of, uh, Ron Beer and Tom Keyes had committed about a million dollars to renovate the lower level, the basement of the student union, the old bowling alley in those areas. Mm -hmm. They wanted to create a better environment for student life happening, student organization, student life. So that project had been completed in the spring of 97, the lower level of the basement of the student union, student organization center. And concurrent with that, <clears throat> Dr. Beer told me this somewhere along the line. He said, students have come to me for two straight years, very dissatisfied with what was existing in the old student life area prior to that. And have told me, this is Dr. Beer's paraphrase, that if you don't get that straight out and make some changes, we're going to go talk to the president. Mm -hmm. So Ron Beer said to them, according to how he... And Kent, where were they? They were there on the second floor of the student union, the offices, where were the they were offices? That's a good point. They were spread. There were some in the basement and there were some on the second floor. They were spread out and they were not a part of one department. Mm -hmm. For example, Fraternity and Sorority Affairs then reported to Tom Keyes, director of the union, singularly as an example. Mm -hmm. And student activities, part of that was in the basement. So they were, and not as many units had been combined right. as happened in 97, 98. So Barrett had said, okay, 
give me up. All I ask of y'all is before you go talk to the president, give me a chance to do what I make changes. So Ron moved forward, created this position, and frankly encouraged uh, uh, probably three or four people to move out or move on because of the dissatisfaction that he sensed that the students were telling him over, over some time. Created the department, did the renovation, <coughs> created this department of campus life, and, and he even sought me and uh, some of my ideas. I, I, I suggested the name Campus Life to broaden it a little bit on just the old traditional student activities notion, for example. So I gave him some suggestions and get, helped him get in touch with some uh, other schools that were doing things. So anyway, make my story short, they created this director of campus life, associate director of the union, and Tom Keyes was very involved in that. And the idea was to, in that new space, to merge and bring together several component parts together of student life. And so, um, they listed the position, advertised it. They had three finalists. They had a guy from Texas A&M, myself, and somebody else were finalists and interviewed, and anyway, I got the job. So I, with Bob Huss and Res Life and Beer and Keys, I agreed that I would start in September of 97, halftime there and halftime in Res Life, through November of 97 when we were hosting Swakure, the Regional Student Organization Leadership Conference, because I was their advisor. So I said, okay, I'll do 50-50 until November and then November 97 make the full shift over. So they offered me the job and one side note to it about the hiring Jerry that primarily was this new student life area. Secondary they wanted somebody who had some auxiliary service background that's what student life at residence life is you know you you pay your own way you don't get any state or tuition dollars you generate everything with room and board dollars. So in the union, student union offers a lot, offers mostly, operates mostly that same way with auxiliary you know, dollars that you generate. So essentially, as I was told and as I've experienced, 85% of my job was director of student life, 15% was the associate director of the union due to my auxiliary service background. And where could I help out there with dining or bookstore or whatever? So I make that move in the fall of 97. Can, can I ask you? Mm -hmm. so in that, your direct report was was Tom Keys was was the the director of the student union. That's right. And so the question I have is that a uh, uh, is that a typical reporting alignment for student or campus life, and would that normally be directly most colleges, universities, would that person report directly to the vice president for student affairs? Many times they report directly on many campuses. That's right, and it was. It was kind of a hybrid position, admittedly, because of the auxiliary part that they wished for me. So it was a kind of a, uh, I, yeah, I'd say it's a little bit unique. Uh, I'd say the norm would be more the other way reporting. And so now today, you know, I have the joint relationship with Mitch Hillcrease, the director of the union, who's been there for five years, and Lee Bird, his student affairs vice president. The student affairs side with her, the auxiliary is more so with him. So it is a little bit, it is a, it's a little unique. And, and the other thing I would say about those early years was um, it was clear to me that they wanted a lot of vitality and energy around the student life component because apparently they'd been real dissatisfied. So part of my thought, you know, using the old real estate principle, location, 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 if you get students together, good things will happen. You don't have to dictate to them. You don't have to require them to do anything, if you get good minds together, I found good things happen. So what happened was, uh, so Tom Key said fraternities and sororities clearly have to be a part of that. They shouldn't be reporting to me, student life. Volunteer Center, which was then reporting the career services, Joyce Montgomery, which, which you could make a case for that, said no, that's a part of student life. So Joyce and Volunteer Center moves down, became the service learning volunteer center. And then there was an interesting discussion that you uh, would know something about. Ron Beer told, put it to me this way, former Vice President Beer. He said, for three plus decades, three committees had studied how do we best serve international students. And there continued to be an Office of International Programs that cultivated contracts, contractual programs, and then there was in student affairs out of the counseling center, international students and scholars 
helping international students adjust and do well. As Beard told me, he said, oh, for over 30 years, three committees had recommended merging of those services. It had never been done. It, it, for whatever reason, it hadn't been done. So finally, the decision made, according to Dr. Beard, was we're going to merge them. So Office of International Programs and the only international students and scholars will come together and be one to better serve students and be more economical. And I always remember this, Ron, so that had been decided. It, Marvin Keener was provost then, Jim Halligan was president, Beer was VP of Student Affairs. As he told me, he said they had, had serious discussions and the decisions were going to make this happen. So Beer calls me like October or November of 97 and says, this is going to happen. I'm trying to decide where to put them. <clears throat> and he said, I'm, th there's a committee that I've formed who's worked on this, and they think it should report to me, the vice president, he said. I don't think that's best. I want to know what you think about making ISS, International Students and Scholars, a part of campus life. I said, well, Ron, uh, from, from the way I see it, I mean, certainly I've worked with international students in Res Life. I said, I said, I'm not an expert on that necessarily, but my point would be, I would think if you get inter the talented international students we have with other campus leaders or student organizations, good things will happen. Proximity, location, location, location. So he said, okay, I'll get back with this October, November. I didn't hear from him on that point till like March. So I figured he had decided to do something else. And one day we're in a meeting or something. He says, oh, by the way, did I tell you we're going to put ISS as a part of campus life? I said, no, I hadn't heard from you all in three or four months. I just assumed you were going to do something different. He said, no, they're coming. So... Those two departments merged in the summer of 98. I always remember this workshop I helped kind of facilitate because honestly that was not an easy merger to competing type of departments with different priorities a little bit, even though it was international in focus, uh, came together and so the International Students and Scholars and Tim Huff was asked to be the manager department head of that and has been ever since. So that was another group who came to be part of Campus Life. So Campus Life that I walked into was so much different than it is today because you had a little element of student activities, you had some non-traditional students, you had a few student organizations, but none of those other areas that I've mentioned that were, were now amalgamated were made a part of what was this developing Department of Campus Life. Ken, I, I forgot to ask you, did, did you, I mean, were you asked to take that position, was it just an internal search or, or did... There was a national search for the position. And a guy from a small college in Iowa, a guy from Texas A&M and myself were all interviewed for it. So I wasn't guaranteed it or told I'm going to move to that. I knew I had a great shot at it because of the input they'd said, uh, solicited for me. But no, I, I, there was a search done and interviews. And so at least I didn't feel like I had it cinched necessarily. What the... Kent, what are the major challenges in your position? There's got to be very interesting diverse groups that you work with, student groups especially. What, what are, on a day-to-day -day basis, what are your major challenges? Wow, every day is so different in that environment. It is, but it's, a, it's fun, it keeps you young, it keeps you on your toes. <coughs> major challenge <coughs> would be, one has been the growth. When I came, there were approximately 250, 270 student organizations Today there's 458 student organizations, so it's more than double. So part of it's the growth and accommodating that growth of student, or, and the beauty of that is it shows we're responding to more student needs and interests because you've got the hockey club and you've got the Spanish club and you've got honoraries and on and on. So the beauty, because remember, earlier comment is getting connected. If students find their way and get connected with peers, friends, get leadership, service opportunities, it has holding power. It's about retention. So. That's a great piece and a great challenge has been the growth. With that growth has come also uh, some financial challenges and responsibilities. Uh, there's a process called Activity Fee Allocation Process or AFAP, student activity fees that students pay that help fund those areas and help fund our area. Uh, there's never enough money to support the student organizations that we've got. So funding, the growth has been great. And now the challenge of this new student union renovation, which is really going to be great when we come back in the building in fall of 2011, but in the interim, we're really even more crunched probably on student organization space. So 
student leaders have been great. They're, they're, we've had five students on the committee all three years of planning. So students are right there at the table. They know what's happening. They've influenced and colored, in fact, what we're going to look like as a student union facility. But nevertheless, there are still some sacrifices being made in the short run for the longer game with this great facility that we're going to occupy on the second floor when we come back into it. So those would be a couple. I think the other thing I'd say in, in the, what, what is that, 13 years I've been doing this, maybe 14 in the fall. I would say, just like for me in the 70s, some institutional changes were going on. There have been changes in the in the 2000s, 90s and 2000s, that are more societal than institutional, I think. Meaning, students that come to us today, in this last decade, are more literate in terms of technology, for certain. But interesting enough, compared to those 70s and 80s students generally, I'm generalizing here some, certainly the 70s, they're more dependent on moms and dads than they were. You, you hear the quote, helicopter parents now. It's not unusual for parents who want to not only come with students for enrollment, which is good, we encourage that, but to walk them through enrollment and kind of tell them what they think they should enroll in. And the students kind of accept that, a dependency, a little more than 25 years ago on mom and dad, which is both good, but it also delays that students maturation and development that's really important part of the college experience so that's what i mean by there have been some societal changes there more than institutional while earlier there were societal and institutional changes while the institution hasn't necessarily had to greatly change now one other thing that's changed is of course since 9 11 is a whole campus security thing and then some of the tragedies on a few campuses so now all of a sudden while we've always had a preparation and awareness of emergency procedures and dealing with the tragedies in student life sometimes including student deaths and I faced more of those than I'd like to count at this school uh, more of a readiness and preparedness for those situations and yet keeping that in perspective mm -hmm. we are in the middle of the country we are in an environment that's uh, very safe a college campus you know it's a residential campus small town in America large university great safe campus compared to most places like some that I visit where you have to have three or four levels of security to get into a building on other campuses. Nothing like that, but still times have changed. So you had to be vigilant about the environment we're in. I even sit on a committee these days called the Behavioral Consultation Team that meets weekly or is needed in the event there are students or people in the environment who we think might be threat to self or others. So there's a collaborative effort with counseling, police, legal affairs, our area, to have a radar up for those students and to try to help them uh, before maybe they leave school or don't succeed or something like that. So that is that is the part of where there's been some societal, some societal change in the sense of elements of safety and security that have been heightened. You know, are there different organizations that you, you the direct advisor to? Yeah, I am the primary organization. The person in my chair is supposed to advise the Student Government Association, SGA. So the student body president and vice president, I advise the A and the student senate chair in their weekly meetings, and then I meet with them as a leadership team weekly. So that's the primary group I advise. I pitch hit sometime for other groups when they lose advisors. A student organization to exist has to have a constitution and bylaws has to have a faculty staff advisor, has to have interested members and officers. So, like for example, right now, I'm the kind of the interim temporary advisor for Blue Key, because uh, the honorary group, because they lost their advisor uh, who retired. So, uh, I do some interim pinch hitting sometimes for student groups without trying to take it on for keeps. But SGA is, you know, which is the primary global student organization that the university goes to for input. You know, I. It's clear to me every president that I've worked with, and certainly those that I've worked with during my 13, 14 years in this position, they want to know what the Senate thinks, what their vote on certain things, like the, the, the tobacco policy, or drop an ad policy, or funding the stadium, Gallagher-Iva renovation, and funding the North Stadium 
and the student bond issue and extension. They want to know what the students think on those things. So it's a great group to work with. And though sometimes they get a lot of press about resume padding and they're for the wrong reason. Boy, in my 13 years, I worked with some great student body presidents from Jennifer Hoffman my first year to now finishing up th this past year with uh, Clint Merritt. Uh, no doubt in my mind, the kids that take those roles, by and large, really sacrifice a lot, give lots of hours for the betterment of the university, and they're really dedicated to serving students, even though the student newspaper and others, do they make mistakes? Sure they do. Do they fumble the ball or are not plan enough ahead? Yeah, we all have done that in life. So, but take out their human tendencies like we all have. There's no doubt in my mind, those 13 or 14 presidents have really been dedicated to serving students. It's a great group to work with. I've enjoyed that. Well, do you have a personal <clears throat> philosophy about student development? I mean, for all these years through residential life yeah. and now with, with student life and, you know, working with students, what, could you share some of that with us? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Uh, I have, there are kind of three tenets, I think, of student life, uh, student affairs philosophy that are mine, that I, that I share with a lot of other people, I think. Um, First is, is that uh, learning is an ongoing kind of a, a total process. And we in the out-of-class experience, co-curricular experience as we call it, have a role in that. They didn't come here because I'm here, because of the fraternities and sororities necessarily, because there's a blue key. They came here for the academic experience, but along the way they want to get connected. And so that's where the co-curricular out-of-class experience is. So I go back to learning is a total process, it's ongoing. Because remember, most students' hours spent aren't in the classroom, they're out of class. So learning is a total process, 24 hours, ongoing. The environment, number two, influences behavior. So whatever environment, residence hall community, whatever environment you have for students influences their behavior and their learning. For example, a stu long before students get very interested that first weekend in class, if they don't have food and hot and cold running water, the basics, the Maslow hierarchy, if you would, if they don't have the basics, you can forget about class because they're not they're not going to stay with you if they don't if they aren't fed and don't have hot running water so therefore the environment influences behavior i know that so learning is total process environment influences behavior what we do in that out of class environment as well as the in class environment and then finally things that we can do to enrich that environment enhance the quality of their educational experience both in and out of class, particularly since my job is out of class, the out of class. So those are three tenets I've really hung my head on. Learning total process, environment, influence of behavior, and then enrichment or enhancement of that environment contributes so much to, to learning. Like I mentioned a while ago, living on campus, they do better academically and they're more likely to graduate in four years, things like that. So those would be three components. And w one thing that I would mention, Jerry, <clears throat> for anybody who ever looks at this tape at any time later, Anybody in student affairs, in fact, I showed it to a faculty member just yesterday who came to my office from the, from the entrepreneurial school, came by and we were talking about some ideas. There's a guy named Ernest Boyer who used to be president of the SUNY system, State University of New York. Ernest Boyer was hired away by the Carnegie Foundation in New York. And Dr. Boyer in 1989 published the results, so over 20 years ago, of a of a, in a results in a booklet called Campus Community, Campus Commu in search of campus community. He interviewed all the college presidents in the country he could reach, and all the college student affairs vice presidents he could reach, several hundred, several hundred, four or five hundred, <clears throat> and asked them what they thought campus of the future should look like, or would be, or should become. So you know, great minds, college presidents and vice presidents, and he published that results for the Carnegie Foundation. So still today I use that because he came up with six tenets that he found in the research after interviewing these people that are important, he thinks, on what colleges could be. And it, of course, transcends academic. It's a whole area. So, examples would be campus should be opened, should be just, should be disciplined and self-governing. It should be have traditions and be celebrity, things like this. Uh, there are six tenets that he identifies. And I, many, any time that I'm talking with anybody about, about student affairs, and in fact, I'm teaching at a, what they call a Stars College in Austin, Texas, next month in June. I think I'm the I'm the, the sample oldest living administrator on the group. We're talking with young 
professionals, 40 of them selected from the United States is the third year I've done it. First year it was in Orlando and last year it was in Baltimore. This year it's in Austin, Texas. There's 40 young professionals and among and my job is is talk with them about student affairs and higher education. And one of the things I'll take to them again, among my components is the value of the Boyer research on these six tenets of what constitutes campus community mm -hmm. as found by interviewing college presidents. I mean, this is valid today because they were looking to the future. It's as valid today as it was when they published that 20 years ago, I think. Well, you talked earlier about some of the student leaders that you worked with. Yes. Uh, from your, but, but speaking generally from your unique perspective of what, nearly 41 years now and over how many thousands of students <laughs> you worked with, and I, and I say that respectfully. Wow. Well, uh, what, what, are there some generalizations you can make about OSU students? i tell you what, I always remember a quote I heard former President Con made, and he kind of said this tongue-in-cheek when asked what it's like to be president of Oklahoma State University. My paraphrase of what he said was, oh, it's not difficult at all when you have the type of students that attend Oklahoma State University, the nature of the student body. Never forgotten that, and I really think there's a lot of truth to that. Because the students that come here, though we get large school students and urban students, we get a lot of small town America students, and we get increasingly numbers of international and certainly out of state. Our Camp Cowboy, our freshman orientation camp, is now almost 70% out of state students come to that because they see some value in that and, the, and a need to, to learn about the university and traditions and history, you know, as they come in. Anyway, uh, yeah. I think, Jerry, OSU students still carry <clears throat> some important threads of the land-grant philosophy. We are found as a, under the Morrill Land-Grant Act, of course, a higher education opportunity for the common man and common woman, the blue-collar school, if you would. And, and though some people cringe at that a little bit today, I still think there are those common threads, for sure, about being a land-grant school about the types of students that come here. Well, we move well beyond just agriculture and home economics mm -hmm. to six major colleges and an honors college and, of course, our professional schools. But there's threads that weave through generations, I think, of OSU alums and students and faculty staff that have been here that bring certain types of students here. Not to say that they're ultra-conservative, but to say that are they a little more conservative as a student body than the University of Oklahoma? Yeah, I would say they would be in my experience but not ultra necessarily. In fact, progressive in many ways. So I would say that about the nature of the campus environment is, and I, I tell you what, I can, eight or nine times out of 10, I can tell you a student in my freshman orientation class that I teach, or leadership class that I teach, or that I meet in meetings or organizational gatherings, eight or nine out of 10 times, I can tell you if they're 4-H or FFA kids mm -hmm. because of a confidence an experience that they've had that others haven't sometimes had. A, a kind of boldness in a in a in a an accomplished able to ability to communicate. So yeah, OSU students I'm gonna to go to my Big Twelve Dean Directors meeting next week at University of Kansas. So there will be, you know, Texas and M, there will be Iowa State, there will be K State, some other land grant schools. And and when we talk and visit about our students, I, I think some of those schools, not A&M quite so much because of its unique history as a male student school, now 50,000 students. I think they've lost some of their sense of community kind of because of size. But K-State and Iowa State, I think have some of those similar threads and they were land grant schools, you know. So, yeah, I, I think there's some unique things about it and uh, about the student body and population and some respect for accountability and responsibility, if you would, to a degree, yeah. Ken, you touched on some of these before, but maybe one more time. In your opinion, how have student services, student life, student programs changed during your career, particularly these last, you know, 13 years or so, but, but totally in your career? What, what have been some major changes? Uh, we we have, uh, and really, I think it's been a, maybe a challenge even for our Board of Regents to have <clears throat> evolved this way. But we have obviously become much less in local parentis. But the Board today 
I think still expects a certain amount of that, really. I, that, they, they still would like for us to be a little more parental than legally we have found that we can be. Mm -hmm. We certainly have a presence of that still, I think, honestly, in local parentis, much more so than some schools, but it's certainly evolved due to the law. So we're, we're less in the place of the parents, if you would, even though I think our board sometimes wants us to be a little bit more, frankly. Um, I would say students of the last decade, for the most part, <clears throat> though they're still searching for academic majors and the right choices, they still, they still are undecided, really. They still aren't. I get my 25 freshmen a year, and two-thirds of them admit they're undecided, even though they declared majors. They're still not sure. So I, I, I think they come here with a focus of, I know I want to be, uh, obtain the higher education degree, but I really am not so sure what I want to do. So on the one hand, they're focused about getting a degree and moving on, but they're not sure about the roads to get there, always. Uh, I think they struggle with that a little bit. I think... Uh, this parental involvement has increased the last half dozen years where parents are calling the shots more for students than they did 25 years ago, which is kind of an interesting evolution. And students, with students respecting that, thinking that's helpful rather than, than not. Uh, and, and of course, many times it is. I'm not questioning that. But um, otherwise, it's, um, campus safety and security is a higher priority in many fronts than it was, you know, before 9-11 and other issues on campuses with, with safety. Um, I think, Jerry, I think, uh, and this is a real challenge, it depends on the campus you're on, I think um, I think college athletics <clears throat> has had to face the fact that diversified student bodies of today no longer come just for athletics or that athletic programs aren't the hub of the university experience like they were 25 years ago or beyond. They're still important and they still draw students both to their events and to campus and to homecoming, great homecoming here. But I think athletics has had to adjust the fact that not only the difficulty in the competition of winning to get students to buy tickets, but also the fact that athletics is competing with many other things that students are interested in, be it a student organization, be it dance, be it allied arts. I think, I think a change is that students today, I've seen have to be sold a little bit more on the athletic experience than they had to 20 years ago. And not to say athletic traditions aren't important still, and they are, but it's just, my point is, fewer students, for the most part, are as rabid about that as they were 20, 25 years ago. So there's adjustment for athletics. And the athletic director, you know, and I've talked a few times about this, everything from student ticket sales to what do we do to, to remind and show students that we care about them, that we're interested in them for ticket sales, but also to, to fill the seats, you know, to, to get in support the teams, knowing that home crowds make a difference in, in sports. So I think that's a change, and a lot of it has to, uh, to do with the offerings and opportunities that students have today that they didn't have two decades ago. You mentioned earlier, Kent, you talked about Vice President Beer and, and and your respect and leadership. Can you mention other uh, key administrators, presidents, vice presidents over the years that you feel have been strong advocates for uh, student uh, and supporters of student life programs? I tell you, you and I both were influenced and touched by Bob Kahn, Dr. Kahn, who passed away this last year, of course, and he and Maxine, who had their open house and invited students out for annual ice cream social during the first week of school. Former President Kahn, was a student's president, I really felt like. And, uh, and he'd been dean of students at Texas A&M and at Drake, so he knew student life and the place it had there, as well as the academic side, which is a great blend. Uh, I also had uh, former President Boger. Uh, the times that, and then I still in Red's life, the times that I got him in the student living areas and units, I could tell he could relate to students, he enjoyed talking to them, he valued that time. 
So I, I appreciate that a lot. Jim Halligan, you know, like to a lot of us, Jim Halligan and Bob Collin were on the same side of the street. I mean, Halligan, three-time chemical engineer, you know, from Iowa State, I'm thinking, but comes to us, he's president from New Mexico State. I think, what sort of president will this guy be? And, and I'd actually talk, of course, to people in New Mexico State. I'd even been out there in another meeting and talked to some of the people who had served under him. And boy, we were pleasantly pleased that he was another calm type of guy, he and Ann, who really put students first and listened to students and had students in their home all the time. I really appreci appreciate that. And, and I, you know, I certainly give credit to Halligan with beer for me being in this position first and then also for the um, for the opportunity then later and I remember you were there I remember when we had our dedication in 97 and down there uh, and Halligan came there and Halligan uh, Dr. Campbell uh, Halligan Campbell were those only two presents there maybe calm I think came for that dedication in 97 and so I when we dedicated that space, and I remember you were there, and I, I, so I, I tell you what, I've been blessed. I've been fortunate. I, uh, for the most part, I've been around. I've been around administrations, including the president and VP of Student Affairs, including our own now Lee Bird, who uh, really are student oriented, who have, have allowed me to operate in a realm with students, and to kind of be their advocate for and with them knowing that they are really serious about wanting to know what students think and that and that they want they want students to weigh in in whatever mechanisms that we have in place so and even you know certainly our current president hargis you know it started back years ago i think with dr smidley supported we now have the annual president's leadership recognition ceremony that takes place every april where we honor outstanding student leaders outstanding student volunteers and outstanding faculty staff advisors so I think it was Smidley who first allowed us to put the name, the President's Leadership Recognition Ceremony on that after, you know, after we started this, after Halligan retired. And of course, Burns Hargis has continued that and did this April. So, boy, I, I, from the time I took this, well, from Res Life days, but particularly these last 13, 14 years, which have been more intense with all students, not just residence hall students. Uh, boy, I've had a lot of support and and getting to coordinate that luncheon monthly now with the president and with students. And it's great to hear what students tell him and what he asked them and his dreams for this university. And uh, I'm, just, I, I, I'm just pleased and proud to have worked at a place that really seems to value students and student input so much. Because I've worked with a lot of people around the country who even though if it weren't for students at our campuses, we couldn't exist. There are a lot of campuses, administrators, you sometimes don't appreciate or understand that, and I've learned that. It'd be a great place for wouldn't for the students. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's right. some, what some research professionals yeah. feel like. That's right. Somebody, <laughs> that's right. Said, oh man, what a great place. And put me in head of a small university without students or something <laughs> like that. I heard that statement right. made one time. Well, fast forward again, or looking forward a yeah. bit. Yeah. And what, uh, are there some emerging trends that will impact students in the coming years that you're seeing? I mean, you mentioned some of that at this point about yeah. parental involvement, et cetera, but are there other trends you see happening in, in student life and, 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 and in st students that, that, it's gonna, that will need to, to change yeah. and evolve to meet these? I think, I, I, uh, I don't like to bring it up, but I think we can't avoid the fact that budgets, uh, higher education budgets are being more closely scrutinized mm -hmm. by the federal government, by state officials, and so forth. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I think budgets and, and financial health of the country and the state will continue to impact some of the things you do in higher education. When it gets into my area, for example, uh, I've had to cut $45,000 this year in education general funds, which has cost me essentially five grad assistants out of 15. Fortunately, I had some graduating, so I didn't have to lose anybody, but we lost positions. So I think there'll be budgetary impact will continue to have to factor in, but that's the nature of the economy, the government rises and falls. So I, I don't think that's always going to be with us, but I think we've got to manage our resources. And there's been this notion of higher ed accountability more. You know, what are you doing with our dollars with higher education becoming so expensive? I was visiting with a girl last week who, uh, his father's on the faculty. 
she was interested in going to Wake Forest, but also saw it's, I think she said $45,000 a year. And she's here visiting and she's just loved what she's seen here. And she says, and plus you can go here for half or, or less of that. Mm -hmm. So I think the cost of higher education to families and the accountability will be important to all of us. And I am a little worried, Jerry, that um, you can't pay for everybody's higher education. You can't grant them all the way through. I mean, you, scholarships and loans, sure, that has to be part of the equation. But I, I, I'm a little concerned about U.S. higher education become a little bit more of the haves and the have-nots on the socioeconomic realm. I'm a little concerned about that impact on society. Just as on a political note, side note, I, I, you know, I'll just, I can't help but mention this. Uh, I noticed that the, the Obama administration is getting ready to appoint a, a, chief ju a justice of the Supreme Court. Nothing against who she is at all, but when they mention if she's confirmed, five of the nine justices would be Harvard educated, Harvard graduates. Nothing wrong with Harvard either, you know. But my point is, if you're not careful in, in education, if everybody comes from the same ilk background, all of a sudden, you may have people, whether it's on the Supreme Court or in your educational environment, just like if all of our faculty were OSU graduates. I don't think that's healthy for the academic environment, in my example, or for the Supreme Court, for most to be trained at the same place. So, where am I going with that? I see the need for us to continue to diversify our faculty because the students coming to us are increasingly diverse. When you look at uh, what the Hispanic population is in western Oklahoma now because of the agrarian business out there, hog farms and so forth, well, some of those students are, going, are coming east to higher education in Oklahoma. So it's going to be a more diverse environment, and that's going to require a little bit more of a diverse faculty, I think, and staff. Uh, so I think we have to recognize that, that there's the budgetary impact, there's the, the, the diversity element. I think we have to be on top of that. Uh, I think, Jerry, there's no doubt, two of my staff members just got back from two weeks in China from IS, my ISS group, International Students and Scholars. As we've seen in the world economy, and, and as you can see our OSU enrollment, India is first in international students and China is now second. It, was, it wasn't 10 years ago there wasn't, wasn't a Chinese student here under communist rule. That whole world has changed. A billion people live there. And as I've been reminded, many of those families looking for U.S. higher education are saving just for the opportunity for their children to be educated in this country. So. There's no doubt our international population, I think, will grow, and the greatest influx will be Chinese. And if we're smart, and I think we are, and we're trying to, we'll cultivate more, uh, just like we have those leaders in Thailand uh, who are OSU graduates. We had 37, admin, almost 40 administrators from four Chinese institutions here last year for a week studying student affairs. Mm -hmm. We've got another group coming the first week of July this year. They're even going to come out to Camp Cowboy mm -hmm. on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. So China, you, you, you're going to have to deal with them in the world and in education. So are you going to uh, try to figure out ways to recruit and bring those students here? Of course, there's several of them here now. Or are you going to miss that part of the higher ed, if you will, marketplace? In India, very similarly, right behind. So that's a change. It's inter staying on international theme for just a second. Uh, Saudi Arabia, about four years ago, committed to sending 7,000 students a year for five years to U.S. higher education. And it's not just for traditional engineering and math, it's the whole four year package. They want them to learn English, literature, they want to learn philosophy, psychology, sociology. So the question is. So who's getting those 35,000 students in higher education in this country? Well, we have Saudis here, and we have a Saudi student organization that exists that started this year. So given point four and Henry Bennett's impact on this institution and international presence and many faculty have served even a decade overseas, I'm proud to say I think we're, I don't know if it's fair to say we're on the cutting edge, but I think we're in tune and in touch with what's going on worldwide in terms of higher ed and our international population. 
So that's something that I see shifting a, a, a little bit. Yeah, change direction just a little bit. There's a couple uh, special student programs we've had at Oklahoma State University for quite a while now. So one of them not quite as long. I want to ask you about okay. one is the Alpha program. Yeah. It's easy to think, oh yeah, Alpha happens every year and we've been doing it for since what, the 1972? 1972. Yeah. But what do you remember about the inception of the Alpha program and your participation in, in back in those early years? I give a lot of credit for Alpha 72, its beginning, and I was chair of Alpha in 73, the second year it existed. I give a lot of credit for Shayla, to, uh, to Shayla Area, who's then Assistant Director of Housing, Single Student Housing. She felt like we could do more as an institution to accept and welcome in new students, primarily freshmen. And so she, I see, is kind of the architect, the author, in getting that program started and moving. And also the importance of integrating academics. I mean, was there fun? Were there ice cream socials? Was there a dance? Was there a movie? Yeah, but there was also uh, sessions that faculty members spoke on your first experience in a college classroom or uh, how to get to know your instructor, things like that. So I give her a lot of credit with that and the value of that in getting it started. And, and, and frankly, the she and the student affairs folks kind of led the charge, as we should in the out-of-class experience, but successfully pulling in the academic and the administrative side as well. So, yeah, that's, uh, she, she, I can give her credit for starting that. What was the, what was the perceived need for Alpha and, and what were some early goals for it? Or man, let me, can you maybe back up and you need to share just real briefly just yeah. what Alpha is maybe a little bit. Yeah, Alpha was a chance, is a chance for students to come to campus. A school here traditionally starts on a Monday. <clears throat> Alpha students would be allowed to come to campus either on a Wednesday or a Thursday and move into the residence hall since they are students, freshmen are required to live on campus. So they're going to be living in the residence halls, almost all. So they come to campus on a Wednesday or Thursday, they move in, they meet their roommate, they can paint their room, decorate the room, mom and dad can say goodbye and go on. And then, and then they get to meet people on their floor. It's the beginning of campus community. And then they get a chance to go to like an outdoor barbecue cookout on Willard Lawn was a traditional thing. And then have an opening session where the president speaks to them. And then they have these little mini classes, mini sessions. Some are recreational and fun in nature, or student organization, and some are more serious on the academic side. So mini courses with a social component. Building those connections, the elements again of a campus community is what Alpha was, was intended to be. And so there's a perceived unmet needs at that time for, for doing that then again? Yeah, I think the feeling was that we, uh, the institution had good intentions, was doing some good things, but we were kind of fragmented. Mm -hmm. we, we were kind of competing for those freshmen interests that first week or two, and this was a way to try to draw those together and coordinate them better, I think. The howdy dance wasn't enough, huh? <laughs> that's right. The, the RHA water meal, watermelon feed and the howdy, howdy dance didn't right. quite do it, that's right. Uh, who were some of the early leaders and staff participants? You, you mentioned Shane Larry. Yeah. Some others you recall? Shayla, Bill Porter, who left here to become dean of students at the University of Georgia. Bill Porter was one of those players. Certainly Norman Moore, as vice president, then had to support that, as did Ron Beard when he came in. Gonzo. Yeah, Sid Gonsolin, who now works at Southern Mississippi, uh, heads their recreation area and assistant VP. And Sid Gonsolin played a role in that. Um, certainly your live-in housing staff members had a big role because of things that were going on in the living units. Um, gosh, a great person. We always needed guys like this. Dan Wesley from the College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Wesley, who headed Arts and Sciences Academic Advising, and now deceased, a great guy. But Dan was one of those practitioners that best of all knew how to weld the academic and the student life component together. So he was a big advocate of this on the student, on the, on the academic side. Um, Dr. Boggs, I think, academic vice president, was supportive of that with Ron Beer, his colleague, and, and saying, let's, yeah, let's give this a try. Let's get the academic side involved. It was Dr. Boggs and Beer who also supported this, quote, early alert system that came out in the 70s. How could we all go about getting faculty staff to somehow trigger a mechanism when they saw a student that wasn't making it and why? You know, the retention attrition question. So that came out of some of the thinking and discussion of those people who were leading Alpha. 
you know, I, I recall in the late 60s the expression, you know, sometimes used in, in when I went out in the field and talked to some counselors <coughs> and, uh, and uh, school administrators about Oklahoma State University. Unfortunately, not all the time, but occasionally come up the term flunk out to you. You know, for for OSU, mm -hmm. and we in that surge of the, of the 60s, the baby had been removed. That there's, we didn't have sufficient uh, tools to assist students, and we lost a lot of students. I mean, and, and I, I have often since, and I'm going to ask you about it. If you, if Alpha was probably the answer to that, trying to get students to, not, it wasn't just about student retention to have better numbers, I mean, but yeah, really right. to help students right. make that transition and more of them to, to succeed, be successful. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great point. It was clearly to help them get mainstreamed into that sense of community and at the same time finding what resources existed. So that if they had, like if mom and dad split up and had a divorce and you're really having trouble with that, there are counseling staff. A very important one is a Career Resource Information Center. Mm -hmm. Career Resource Center, helping students realize and face the fact that they're honest, they aren't sure of academic majors many times, So, but we, we can help you resolve that and find, excuse me, find a career choice or a major that's compatible with what, you know, and it starts with these two basic questions, which it's so logical that career information people, career resource people ask, what are you good at and what do you like to do? Because if you can figure out how to connect what I'm good at and what I like to do with an academic major and college, then I'm going to have career opportunities that I'm going to be satisfied fulfilled in. So what am I good at? Do I like numbers? Do I like people? Do I like animals? Do I work indoors or outdoors? What, what do I like to do? You know, it, it, when we connect those two questions with students, we get them on target earlier for the right academic major, and then for, therefore opportunities in terms of the the job situation, the job market. Can you know, follow up on a little bit? Is is a special program that started a few years ago, Camp Cowboy? Yeah, and, and it really is is a tremendous enhancement. I, I uh -huh. had the Alpha and country before before Alpha. But well, what's the story behind the inception of Camp Cowboy? Great question, Jerry. Uh, we started Camp Cowboy. The first camp was in 1999, so I think we've what, finished 13 years now, going to our 14th or something like that. 1999, and it comes out of I had a couple of I had a young lady named uh, Misty Montgomery. Uh, it was Misty Ambrose then. She ran for student body president and came to see me, but she wasn't elected. But she came and said. You got any ideas, or what are we? I'm a little concerned about what we're doing for freshmen or not doing for freshmen. This would have been about 90, this would have been about, uh, uh, actually, since I was still in Red's life, so it was 95 or 96. Maybe it was a year before, maybe 96. And then SGA appointed a, a freshman, two co coordinators, SGA, Student Government Association, to study the issue of freshman retention. Misty was a part of that. So, the vice president, Ron Beer, hearing that, and others in the administration said, well, maybe we need to look at this. Because what we we're finding was that if lar all of us large schools are honest, one of our biggest challenges is freshman retention, helping a big school seem small. How, how do you capture them? Because really, Jerry, what we find is students don't fail here, leave school here because of academics primarily. It's other stuff. It's other personal things sometimes. Sometimes it's financial, sure, but many times it's other things. So what, what happened, so Beer said, how about this? Did a little homework. So Steve Hasley on my staff who coordinates my leadership program, he took two students and drove to Texas A&M and visited Fish Camp, which had been going for 75 years. I took two students and went to Auburn University and studied Camp War Eagle. We went through those two camps with two students each, summer of 98 and came back and, and then those students and others sit down and say, here's what we liked about those programs, here's what they missed, and we're going to put something together. And from that came Camp Cowboy, the first one offered in the summer of 99, and the first two directors were stu two student females, Misty Ambrose, now Misty Ambrose Montgomery, who's a mom and a lawyer in Edmond, and uh, Kendra Littrell from what, Guyman, Oklahoma, who now is in Tulsa, and we had a 10-year reunion a few years ago back there, and th those two gals, among other directors, came back for that. So Kendra and Misty took hold of it and helped bring it to fruition with myself and Steve Hasley serving as their advisors since since the beginning. So can, can you kind of explain mm -hmm. Camp Cowboy? 
the components of it and how it works. Camp Cowboy is a weekend freshman immersion campus, what I call it. So they come to campus at 2 o'clock on a Friday. They get assigned to small groups. Part of the power of anything is student peer influence in higher education and education in colleges. The influence of the student peer is very important. So we have co-counselors, male and female, with groups of about eight or ten students that form the ten groups that weekend. So they, they start with small group interaction, getting acquainted, and the buses pick them up at three o'clock, bus them out, they're captive. We bus them out and bus them back on Sunday afternoon for the three o'clock closing ceremony. They can't leave. So you start which day, th Thursday? Always on Friday. On Friday. Always begins on Friday and ends on Sunday. And so Friday afternoon is, as we, we take them to Camp Redlands on the north side of Lake Carl Blackwell, an old WPA camp from the 20s that we've actually had some donors contribute money to make it air conditioned. And so we have a big lodge, we have 80 acres to roam on and, and, and so forth. And so what we do is the Friday afternoon is getting acquainted and it's a spirit night when they learn the tra traditions of the alma mater, the fight song, they meet Pistol Pete and a surprise appearance from the, at a campfire late that night. They meet coaches and athletes that night, the student leaders. It's about building spirit and tradition. And by Friday night, the students already know the fight song of the alma mater of the university. Saturday morning is dedicated to, uh, and they call, have what they call camp times where they help them learn the s songs and school spirit. And, and that's after the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, spirit sessions of Friday night where they have met, like I said, coaches and athletes of, of the various sports. Saturday morning is faculty staff time. They bring faculty staff out to work with them on, in small groups and also on an administrative panel that they hear services talked about. And then faculty jump into the small groups. And then each, each they divide it in two groups on a Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning. They spend a half day on the high ropes course, which is, we've had a ropes course out there for 40 years, but they've got a brand new one now that's only two years old. That's approximately, it's, a, it's twice the height of the other. I'm going to tell you, the high ropes course is probably 125 feet off the ground. And trained facilitators put them in their harnesses, show them how to do things safely, and up go the freshmen. It's kind of an experiment, experiential leadership experience for them. Uh, so all of the freshmen go through the high ropes course, either on Friday, Saturday afternoon or Sunday morning. Uh, by the way, Saturday evening has a talent show where the groups compete against each other. Uh, and of course, we bring out a faculty and administrators, not only for small groups, but to have the meal with us. And every camp is named after an outstanding faculty or staff member that the students get together and say, we want to honor him or her. So there are five camps these days. We're settled into five. Well, and then we do one for the varsity football team in August, too, a mini camp. Because of two football coaches, Les Miles and now Gundy, both have felt like it's a way for student athletes to get to know student leaders, you know, in a, in a microcosm sense. And, and they also come having learned the alma mater and the fight song, by the way. So those five, one camp because of Jim Halligan's commitment permanently carries the name of Camp Halligan. Then there are four more faculty staff members selected each year by the student directors on people who have had a big influence on the university environment. So it's always Camp Somebody. And sometimes it's been a coach, many times a faculty member, and Camp Halligan, something else. And of course, you're being honored this year, Jerry, Camp, Camp Gill will be one of the camps. So, because that notion is kind of weaving together the tradition, the history of the university. By the way, both evenings are closed with a campfire at the lakeside. Friday night, it's an outstanding alum, a graduate who comes and talks about his or her experiences and what the OSU education experience meant to them. And by the way, that's when Pistol Pete comes out of the dark, shoots his gun, takes off his head, which he never does otherwise, as he tells them, and tells them about Frank Eaton and Pistol Pete, and they learn about who Pistol Pete is. And I've had two or three guys who have become Pistol Pete's tell me that the night that they were at Camp Cowboy and saw Pistol Pete come out and take the head off and tell him about Frank Eaton and Pistol Pete, that night they decide they want to be huh. Pistol Pete's. Josh Pulver being the most recent one. And then uh, the se second campfire, Jerry, on Saturday night, we build it up so you need to be there for the campfire Saturday night because you're going to be really impressed with the speaker that night. And we turn the table on them and we tell them the speaker for tonight is you, the class of 2017 or whatever class it would be, four years. You're the speaker tonight. And one by one, not that they have to, they begin to stand up and talk about what they're feeling about coming to OSU and being a freshman 
and after 24 hours with these upper class student leaders. Remember, Camp Cowboy is led by four student directors and about 35 counselors and rangers that work the whole weekend. So the, the student peer influence is what drives Camp Cowboy, mm -hmm. the energy and talent. You and I, they might like us temporarily, but they wouldn't jump and do all and have the fun things that they do if it weren't student led. Mm -hmm. So uh, that night, those students on a Saturday night start talking about what they feel like being a, a student at OSU. And some really interesting and neat testimonials come out that night. So, and by the way, in terms of data, I always remember in front of President Halligan, Vice President Keener and Beer, I always remember being challenged a little bit in 97, 98, says, I don't know, by some academic folks and others said, I don't know that we need another program that's going to cost students more to come to OSU and it's not like a big social weekend. So all along from the very beginning, it's been important that we kept academic and retention numbers. And to this very day, students that go to Camp Cowboy versus those that don't make higher GPAs. I think it's a .17 on the average higher. And number two, are more likely to graduate in four years. And that's double digit. I think it's 11%, 11% higher rate of graduation in four years than those who didn't. And if you go to five and six year rates, it's, it approaches 20%. Mm -hmm. So retention and GPA have proven themselves mm -hmm. there very strongly. Mm -hmm. That was a question I was going to ask you. I appreciate you bringing that out. Uh, we knew we needed to have that because did it make a difference or was it just a social weekend? That's been very important. And it is social, but it's a lot more than that. Well, Ken, would you feel comfortable talking about your role and, and the inception of it and continuing? <laughs> I think sometimes my best advice, best role for me is to get out of the way because the students have so many good ideas and energy and thoughts, just like our four new directors now are working hard on enrollments and they came and helped me with Special Olympics last week. They volunteered their time last week. They, they are movers and shakers and uh, they're great academic, academically successful and acknowledged campus leaders. So really my role, I think, is really a facilitator help get them together because they are different people and they come from different backgrounds and they think differently. So they aren't a team when they come together. So my role is to facilitate and help them come together as a leadership team and then to, to see how important their responsibility is. Everything from safety, like if there's a tornado warning, to being sure we get the food bids out. A lot of the mundane behind the scenes thing that they realize, oh, I didn't know you had to do all this to make these camps work. Uh, to help them see that and, uh, and then to be behind them because honestly of these other 150 camp staff members who work the five camps I mean 35 or 40 per camp a lot of those could have been directors but they weren't selected mm -hmm. but they're movers and shakers so uh, we kind of help reinforce them hey y'all are special people because of this task and challenge and some of these people may challenge you then sometime but remember you're the four selected we're going to support you in what you do uh, and if we differ on it we'll pull you aside privately on that we try to help realize Jerry that they are the university. They represent the university. There's, so there's a standard of behavior and practice that's real critical. We don't just uh, slop into those roles. We don't just uh, show up and hope it goes well. We've really got to be on top of our game. So I, I think I'm a facilitator advisor is, is what I do. I kind of try to stay out of the way. I, I do enjoy going to them. It's a lot of fun.